You are tuned into the Dr. Tina Show with Dr. Tina Moore. For more, visit drtina.com. On this episode of the Dr. Tina Show, I'm going to be sharing this study with you that showed a jaw-dropping 45% reduction in dementia risk. Not from some new Alzheimer's drug, not some, not from some fancy intervention, but from good old GLP-1s. And I'm so excited to share the data with you. So let's jump in. All right. So this was a very interesting study. They basically, it was done by two undergrad students. So that right there is very cool. Um, They looked at 26 randomized control clinical trials, over 164,000 participants. And this study included patients with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular risk factors and or actually. And they looked at different types of blood sugar lowering drugs like metformin, GLP-1s, SGLT-2s, uh, SGLT-2 inhibitors, I'm sorry. And they compared them all and then they sorted out what cardiovascular benefits were happening and dementia risk. So the mean age participant was about 65 years old, 64.4 years, I guess 64 years old. 35% were women And the average duration follow-up was 31.4 months. I will say that's a limitation of the study. They didn't follow up with them very long. And as we know, dementia takes decades to manifest. So there's that. But overall, what they found, the key findings were that the cardioprotective glucose lowering therapies did not significantly reduce the risk of dementia or cognitive impairment overall. This is important and I want to reiterate what this means. Whenever I talk about GLP-1s and their benefits, everybody wants to argue, well, wouldn't reducing your blood sugar, wouldn't optimizing your metabolic health, wouldn't weight loss already improve outcomes with X, Y, or Z? And yes, I would say yes. This showed that with other medications designed specifically to be cardioprotective and lower glucose, they did not see the dementia risk reduction. So it's not as obvious as one would think it is. It's not just, oh, well, they lost weight, so of course their brain health improved. Or uh, they lowered their blood sugar, so of course their brain health improved. Those things should indeed improve brain health, but not like the GLP-1 did. GLP-1 receptor agonists specifically were associated with a 45% relative reduction in dementia risk compared to controls. SGLT2 inhibitors showed no significant effect on dementia risk. Metformin had no eligible trials. And the other drug, I cannot pronounce, pioglitazone showed no significant benefit. Secondary findings, uh, no statistically significant reduction in vascular dementia or Alzheimer's disease separately for any drug class. GLP-1 receptor agonists showed signals toward benefit across several cognitive measures, but no cognitive score improvements were consistently demonstrated across all included trials, and no significant impact was seen on Lewy body dementia or frontotemporal dementia. I get asked about that a lot, actually, about specific types of dementia. They had too few cases to really determine, so I'm not sure. The reason I got interested in GLP-1s, and for those who don't know what GLP-1 receptor agonists are, these are the drugs like Wegovy, Ozempic, Monjaro, that bound. These are all GLP-1 receptor agonists. And the reason I got interested in them originally was because of their neuroprotective benefits. That was what got me looking at them. And when I started finding the data in both rodents and humans, I was like, what? This is not what we're being told. So, and beyond that, yes, they have a very incredible I believe if you break down the mechanisms, I just did a podcast about terzepatide and metabolic health overall. They look to be protective of metabolic health. They definitely induce weight loss. I don't think it's just because they get you to eat less. I think it's because they actually improve your insulin signaling, your insulin reception. Um, There's a lot of different mechanisms going on here. They impact the immune system directly and indirectly. They lower inflammation in the brain and throughout the body. All of these things will help with overall cardioprotective benefits, weight loss, uh, neurologic benefits. I mean, it's they're pretty profound. So the interpretation here was GLP-1 receptor agonists may offer neuroprotection beyond their cardiovascular benefits, potentially through anti-inflammatory antioxidant and anti-apoptotic mechanisms, that's programmed cell death, um, at the neuronal level. 
SGLT2s might have a neuroprotective potential, but data so far does not show a statistically significant dementia risk reduction. Importantly, while observational studies suggested possible benefits, this meta-analysis only showed a statistically significant dementia reduction for GLP-1 receptor agonists, not the other drugs that they looked at. The conclusion was only the GLP-1 receptor agonists demonstrated a statistically significant reduction in risk for all-cause dementia. This is really exciting. It's not entirely that groundbreaking if you've been looking at the data though. I get a lot of hate for talking about this peptide and I don't understand why because its neurocognitive impacts are profound. I did a whole podcast episode with Max Lugavere on his Genius Life podcast and we talked specifically about the neurocognitive benefits and I shared some pretty great data there. I've got a oh gosh, an eight-page lesson inside my GLP-1 Done Right University. It's an educational program. It's my big course. I have a free four-part video series where you can check out if this is new to you and you're like, wait, what? Ozempic may potentially have these other impacts on the body. Um, Getting away from brand name drugs, just GLP-1 agonists in general, I share with you what the data is looking like around those. So it's a four-part video series and you'll get a new video each day. On the third day, you'll be invited at a discount to participate in my big program, which is for clinicians. But as of right now, and for a very short time, I'm it's open to the public too. So it's been open to the public since its inception. I am shutting the whole thing down. I'm revamping it. And when I relaunch it, the only only clinicians will be able to gain access to the clinical components of the course. Right now, the general public has access to everything as well. And it's a beefy course, but I've got a multitude of lessons in there from tip to toe. Beyond that, I talk about why you need all the other treatment components to go along with your GLP-1 agonist journey. It's not just about taking a GLP-1 agonist. You have to have your hormones in order. You have to have your gut health in order. You have to be leading an insulin-sensitive lifestyle. You have to be strength training. I have modules on each section of those. I have a module on how to find a doctor to work with, a good doctor to work with. Um, It's a beefy course. But inside one of the particular modules where I go tip to toe about the benefits of GLP-1s and provide you all the most recent data, we've got a bone health lesson, a brain lesson, and a cancer and GLP-1s. Interesting information in there. Cardiovascular uh, health and GLP-1 lesson. COVID and long COVID and GLP-1. Gastrointestinal, immune and inflammation. Fascinating lesson there. Liver, gallbladder, pancreas, a whole pancreatitis and GLP-1. Uh, I'll just, I'll just let you know on that one, no increased risk of pancreatitis has been seen in virtually any study. So long-term. It's just not there. So you can put those rumors to rest. Um, Musculoskeletal, you'd be fascinated by what it does to your muscles and your bones. And it's regenerative. Newsflash, it's not actually dissolving your muscles and bones, regardless of what you're hearing out there, regardless of what some of these huge influencers who should know better, who seem to have a good handle on literature are saying to you. It does not turn your bones to dust. In fact, it's anabolic and healing to your bones from what I can tell. And I have a whole lesson about it. Pancreatitis, like I said, renal, so kidney health. There's a whole lesson on there in in kidneys and GLP-1. Thyroid cancer, I know that's a big one that people want to hear about. That's in the cancer lesson. And then type 2 diabetes, metabolic health. I'm working on more about weight loss, uh, but yeah, I've got data up to my ears. I've got a 40 plus page document in there in the big course that you can have access to when you join that big program. Um, It's all the studies. It's, It's organized by body system. So again, this is for clinicians and for healthcare professionals, but I'm letting the general public in as of now. And that's not gonna be for long. I'm what we're at the end of April, I'm pulling it down probably in the next 30 days, I'm going to be revamping it. So, and when I relaunch it, the general public version is going to be much, much simpler, way less clinical. So if you're one of those people and you really like to chew on the information and you really want that deep dive and you're a smarty pants and you want access to all the data and you want access to all the information, um, grab it while it is in this iteration because it won't be this way for very long. So this article is called Cardioprotective Glucose Lowering Agents and Dementia Risk, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. It's in JAMA Neurology, published April 7th, 2025. So pretty brand new 
and you guys can grab this for free online and look it over. It's laid out well. It's got the study broken down on the first page. It's got some key points to look at. And I think it's very interesting. And I, from what I am sitting in, in the waist high, neck high, um, piles of data that I've looked at, these peptides are pretty incredible on the neurologic system. I'll share a little bit more with you and then we'll close. The mechanisms of action, the way that GLP-1s work in the brain is that they decrease pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, interleukin-1-beta. They increase mitochondrial biogenesis and fatty acid oxidation. They increase endothelial repair and neurovascular support. They decrease microglial and astrocyte activation. They increase neurotrophic signaling, i.e. BDNF. They increase serotonergic and dopaminergic tone. So I can't think of anything else aside from exercise that has anywhere close to the impacts on the brain. If you're not keen on taking a GLP-1 and, or that's not something that's accessible to you, because right now the lawsuits are, it's crazy what's happening with the lawsuits. I'm just trying to stay out of all of it. Um, there, there are some other options. I just did a really interesting podcast with a woman named Sarah Kennedy, who is the CEO and founder of Calocurb. It's a GLP-1 stimulant supplement and fascinating, really fascinating interview. So I encourage you, that was just recently recorded and published. So I encourage you to go back and listen to that episode as well. We'll put that in the show notes in the further listening section. And I've got a whole Ozempic Done Right series of podcasts that you can listen to where I talk about a variety, and this is all for you guys, a variety of different implications, the bones, the muscles. I've already talked about that. I don't need to keep, I don't need to do another episode on that. So go back and listen to all of that. And then again, my free four-part video series, which will take you into the course where I talk to you. And regardless of how you're choosing to dose the GLP-1, you still have to do it right. If you're a clinician, you have to do it right. And if you're the general public taking these, you have to do it right. And the chances of you finding a doctor who knows what they're doing when it comes to metabolic health is not that great. So I highly encourage you to empower yourself through education and check out the big course while it is in the iteration it's in. I heard something today by a well-known and well-respected uh, doctor, influencer doctor, and someone I like very much. And they said... They were giving some, you know, really t horrifying stats about health in the United States and saying that there's nothing that we can do. There's no medication that we have to treat dementia. There's no medication we have to treat obesity. There's no medication we have to treat metabolic dysfunction. There's no medication that we have to treat type 2 diabetes that actually works, that we must address these issues with diet and lifestyle. And I completely agree but this doctor is totally wrong because at a root cause level, these peptides, I firmly believe, do treat these conditions. They're not just a Band-Aid. And you'll have to go through and listen to the rest of my content to understand because it's a multi-hour storyline. Um, so I'm just a little bit embarrassed for people who are trashing on these peptides at this point. They're clearly not keeping up with the data. If your physician is one of them, they're clearly not keeping up with the data. And I have hours of it for free available on my podcast. And if you head to drtina.com forward slash Ozempic Uncovered, you can check out the GLP-1 Uncovered program. And like I said, it's free. It's a four-part video series. And from there, you'll be invited to join GLP-1 Done Right University. So with that, I will bid you adieu. Thank you so much for listening to the Dr. Tina show. I'll make sure that the link to the study is in the show notes so you can inform your doctor and all of your friends and all of the GLP-1 haters out there. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Dr. Tina show. This is a Wellness Loud production produced by Drake Peterson and mixed by Mike Fry. Theme song is by John the Guilt. You can watch the full video version of this podcast inside the Spotify app or on YouTube. As always, you can email the podcast at podcast at drtina.com. That's D-R-T-Y-N-A. And if you like this episode, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. You can also find all of my offerings on my website at drtina.com. For more shows by my team, go to wellnessloud.com. 
See you next time. And thanks for listening. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. It does not constitute the practices of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. I am a doctor, but I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is intended not to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions.